You're listening to Tarazi Tuesdays with the Bible is Literature. Hi, this is Father Mark Boulos. And this is Dr. Richard Benton. And you are listening to Tarazi Tuesdays with the Bible as Literature podcast. Good morning, Richard. Good morning, Father Paul. How are you today? I am very well, thank God. Thank God, indeed. We have a great topic today. Scripture, Father Paul has been known to say, Richard, does not propose a better establishment. That is a very interesting and, I think, important statement. And so, Father Paul, we're very happy to have you here to talk about this question of Scripture not proposing a better establishment. This, I believe, is the closest to the heart of the matter, namely that the approach to Scripture was tainted by the Greco-Roman mind. The so-called fathers of the Church were Greco-Roman obviously. And their world, which is our world, is the world of the city. The society for us is the city. The word civilization comes from city. This is our world view, and we impose it on the Bible. We assume that the so-called biblical restoration is a return to the situation we call original, but this time, if not improved, more secure. But this belies the scriptural proposition, and I'm going to go very quickly over this matter. In Genesis 1, it is God that creates the world, the heavens and the earth. There is no chipping in. The Orthodox have this famous synergia that God does and we also, God and man. That's why we stress this aspect in Jesus Christ, the divine and the human. And obviously it's our world because we have no clue how God's heavens look. But in Genesis 1, it is God that created that. In Genesis 2, it is he that plants the garden. And I want to stress this because ultimately in Isaiah and Ezekiel, we have a return to Eden. And people always assume that the return is the return to where we were, the way we view our world. But The world of the Bible is obviously the desert. The name Zion, Zion, is from a root that means desert, wilderness. There is nothing, and it is God that produces everything, establishes everything. I know that in Scripture we have the word establish, but it is God that establishes. We are established. And thus the return is not so much a return to a place, as the Jews and the Christians assume, but a turn of the heart. And that's the play in the Bible where we have the same verb, shub. That's very important. That was captured by the Septuagint, which is rendered as metania, change of the mind, change of the attitude on our part. And let me go through an impressive series of biblical statements that reflect that. We have basically the issuance of the law that is supposed to protect the people in the earth of the promise, promulgated and written in the wilderness where are no cities away from Egypt, please notice, and before the people enter into Canaan. Actually, God asked Moses, to go and get the people out of Egypt to bring them to this mountain in the wilderness of Midian. Well, it's an impossibility. I mean, uh, where would you put all these words on stone and then carry them for 40 years? Obviously, it's a metaphor. It's a hyperbolic metaphor. But then the return at the end is precisely a return to the mountain of teaching, Isaiah chapter 2, which in Ezekiel is rendered a return to an earth where we do not have boundaries and cities in chapters 47 and 48. Very important. So here again, our mistake is that we assume that we're returning to the earth of Joshua, 
No. Joshua destroyed cities and built other cities. And at the end, he dies. And the people return to the bear. We can hear, we can see the twists of the scriptural stories. Whatever we assume is good, is not good. The good in the Bible is to do what God asks you to do. That's the good. There are no ethics in the Bible. And I want to repeat that. There are no ethics in the Bible. The good and the evil is not discussed in the Academy of Plato. The good is imposed upon us, and what is not good is bad, is the evil. And remember that the human beings were not allowed to eat from the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of the good and the evil. So at the end, obviously, there is mention of city. I'm not saying that there is not, but it's not a city the way we look at it. Let's go for two striking examples, Ezekiel and Revelation. In Ezekiel, in the land, where the twelve tribes live and where is no reference to any city. The only city is called the Lord is there. Very funny. So it's a metaphoric, symbolic name that all the twelve tribes are around the city and they listen to the teaching of God. And this is how they return to God, to his ways. In the book of Revelation, we hear about a city. Here again, the Greeks always stress the city, city, my colleagues, the Greeks, you know, but there is a city, Father Paul. But the city comes down from heaven. Have you ever seen a city coming down from heaven? I'm watching the TV show Salvation. There is only a meteor coming down from heaven that is going to destroy earth. A city does not come down from heaven. It is built. That's why. You have to raise money to build your church. It does not come down from God. As we say, the church is a divine human institution at the same time. Absolutely not. The church comes down or comes out of the mouth of God. So I need to stress this. The people have to understand that if there is a city, it's a scriptural city. If there is a God, there is a scriptural God. If there is a return, there is a scriptural return. We have to redo in our mind the definition of the words kata tasgrafas, according to scripture. And just to make Richard happy, and he is not happy unless we bring up Hosea. Well, you see at the beginning, you have a showdown between the Lord and Baal. And God says, to correct all this, I have to punish you, but bringing you back to the wilderness where originally I conquered your heart and I'm going to reconquer it another time. And there, very powerfully in that chapter, as I stress in my book, we have a reference, the only extra Genesis reference to the creation in the words of Genesis 1, the birds of the air. So we could see that this Zion is not the old Jerusalem. Again, I stressed in my book that the renewed Jerusalem is Zion and the name Jerusalem disappears in chapter 1 and we have mention only of Zion, which is this high mountain. So there is a play, and we talked about that in one of the podcasts, that Zion is beyond Jerusalem. At the end of the book of Psalms, Jerusalem disappears and we have a reference to Zion. And yet it is not a utopia. That's something I need to stress again and again, because the intellectual says, well, if it is so, then it is utopia. The Bible is utopic. It is not utopic because we have a reference to the locality. I don't even dare to call it city, locality, Tadmor. That, let me remind my hearers, Solomon built at the same time as he built Jerusalem, in 2 Chronicles chapter 8. And interestingly, in the Bible, Jerusalem is destroyed by the decision of God. But at no point we hear of Tadmor being destroyed. And please remember that 2 Chronicles is the last book of the Bible. (laughs) 
So we hear only once of Tadmor. It is in the last book of the Bible. And that cannot be happenstance. Logically, cannot be happenstance. It is intended. So it's high time, especially now with the establishment of the contemporary state of Israel and the law of return and the Christians join the bandwagon by speaking of the return. Remember, Eastern Christianity wanted to re-establish the entire Orient as a Christian civilization a la Byzantine Roman Emperor. And 800 years later, the West produced crusades. They put the sign of the cross, as Constantine did, to reconquer the Orient. I mean, it was a trick to say from the Muslims and so on. I mean, it's like modern politics now. We always throw in a third party that is evil to justify what we want to do. And we repeat the same thing. And I believe that if we continue following this path, we are doomed because we're not listening to scripture. And if you don't listen to scripture, then you are implementing the punishment of God on you, on us. I mean, how many times I said scripture is a trap. Actually, it's an entrapment. The moment you accept Genesis 1-1 and the following verses, you're trapped already. You can get out of it if you follow the path of your own way of looking at things. So the topic, again, Father Mark, as you mentioned, is very essential. And, you know, I can go on and on and on and on, but I would be repetitious. You see, I discovered that the more the topic is central, you actually don't need to talk about it much, except bringing up a few examples that will convince those who have ears to hear, obviously. But then if someone listening to me goes back and throws at me, but you know, the city is the expression, you're talking like the ancient Greeks. And I understand that. You don't need to repeat it to me. And I know I sound arrogant, but let me risk it. What I'm saying to my hearers is novel to their ears. But what they are telling me, I heard it since the age of three. There is nothing new. <laughs> so we have to be very careful. Yesterday I listened to a podcast. A friend sent it to me about a dean speaking, you know, in Chicago and so on. Very nice, very powerful. But still, I think, being Lutheran, he could not but mention Martin Luther and Philip Melanchthon and so on, and their works and their writings. Remember John Calvin, who, in my eyes, is technically greater than Martin Luther. And yet, Geneva is his city. I mean, talk to Swiss, to Presbyterians. That's the way we think about it. And here in the United States, just go to... The buildings of the early U.S., you know, it's all Greco-Roman, and until now, you go to Washington, D.C., and that's what you see. And I was very impressed. I didn't know about that. My first experience in the Museum of American History, you see a statue of George Washington seated either like Caesar or like Zeus, and what's the difference, you know? So this is how our mind is established. I mean, just listen to ourselves every time we build a church. We talk about it and the bishop comes and so on and blesses and anoints with oil and so on. And then everybody assumes that it's a building. And we refer to the book of Leviticus. But my dear friends, the book of Leviticus reflects the situation in the wilderness. All you had, a tent. Even with all the ornamentation, once you fold it, you can't see the ornamentation. So it's a trick on your mind. Who would like to have a tent like this, that every time you unfold it, you take it to another place, you fold it, you take it to another place, you unfold it, and you have to reinstate all the ornamentation again. I mean, we have to remind the people of these things. Would you do that yourself? Obviously not. I mean, it's exhausting. We give the impression that we do this every Sunday in church, but it's not true. Everything is there. All you do is to bring the bread and put it in that place. And so, But imagine that you have to put 
the same ornamentation every Sunday and if you have a feast day during the week and so on. I mean, this goes back to inviting my hearers to hear scripture. I mean, <laughs> that's all. And I hope they are not going to say after listening to me that this is what Father Paul is saying. I heard it throughout my life in the classroom. That's your opinion, Father Paul. But we refer to the real reality of the theology that we have in our minds. Well, Scripture is inviting you to have God not even in your heart, let alone in your mind. But His law has to be in your heart, and you have to follow the Scripture law. Many people want to follow the Bible in order to establish a better society. How would you respond to them? What is the goal of obeying Torah? What's the teleology or the endpoint that the scriptural writers are imagining? Well, that's the hardest part because people want to imagine and you use that word. Imagine means to project a picture out of your mind. Let me answer you by going through Matthew. I know you love Hosea, but I think the book of books is Matthew. You have a gentleman who is presented as the messenger of God, and he goes into the wilderness of Syria. By the way, notice that Matthew names the wilderness of Mark as Syria. He is the only one who says that. Please check chapter 4. And there on a high mountain, remember Isaiah chapter 2, he teaches his disciples, and at the end we hear that the crowds listen to his teaching through his disciples, which is the last verse of the Gospel of Matthew. Go and repeat to the nations whatever I taught you until the consummation of the age, which goes back to Matthew 13, where God in the parable does not allow anyone to clear the weeds. On the last day, I shall send my angels. But on the last day, you don't have an institution because you are judged on whether you have taken care of the needy neighbor within the institution. Notice, you have not visited the prisoners and the poor and so on and so forth. The scriptures answer to your question is that your question is invalid because it is already tainted with this vision of a better society, a better civilization. In other words, you always are referring to citizenry the way we perceive it. But I said that scripture is dynamiting this, not with TNT, but by not referring to it in the establishment of the scriptural world of the scriptural God. In other words, It shoves it to the side. How many times I said that the Bible is essentially emasculating. That's why the people don't like it and they like to play theology to cover up their sins. A better society. How can you improve? Well, let me throw you a curveball which I used in my classroom. I say to my Orthodox students, notice how all your teachers and professors are going to tell you how during Lent we yearn to grow in humility. Just listen to it. To grow. Notice the verb you're using in humility. How can you grow in humility? When John the Baptist said, he must grow and I must get smaller. But That's how we do it. That's self-righteousness to grow in humility. When people call you humble, you are already in trouble. As my colleague said, remember what Father Paul told us all. You can't be humble in Scripture. You have to be humbled, the Pharisee and the publican. This one returned and the other returned. Humbled, whoever aggrandize himself will be put down. And this is the name of the game that is already there in Genesis chapter 10. So clearly, the founder of civilization, Cain, disappears from the Adamic genealogy. And those who wanted to build the building also were destroyed. It is God that destroyed it. So I would say, I took my time here, and thank you for the question, to point out that the phrasing of the question 
is already incorrect according to scripture since at the end you're going to be dealing with ezekiel 47 and 48 richard had to drop off because he had another engagement but i want to follow up his question with an example that he gave in one of our regular podcast episodes we were talking about the gospel of mark and richard mentioned a kurdish gentleman he had spoken to who said I don't want the Kurds to have their own nation because we'll just do the same thing the Turks did to the Kurds. Wow, there you go. Very powerful example that demonstrates the reality. The power in his statement is the reason behind the first part of his statement, which he gave in the second part. Why he was saying what he was saying. It's very important to present him like that because people say, I disagree with him. Fine. I mean... If we have a human mind, we must disagree with the Bible. Come on now. Right. (laughs) How many times you heard me in the classroom say, people who say, I like Paul. I mean, come on now. How can you like Paul, who is dismantling Jerusalem and Athens? When you give that example of this gentleman, it's very important to secure the teaching through that so that you already preempt the statement of someone saying, I disagree with him. Obviously, you disagree with him. Look at your civilization. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. I mean, as a Palestinian, or at least part Palestinian through my mom, I've actually from a young age understood this, that everybody knows that when the Christians are in charge, the Muslims suffer. When the Muslims are in charge, the Christians suffer. (laughs) When the Jews are in charge, the Muslims and the Christians suffer. And I kind of realized at a young age, you live with this dishonesty where you know, you know that if your group were in charge, they would be just as bad. But the dishonesty, which you touch on when you talk about people pretending they like Paul, is that you know that if your group were in charge, the others would suffer. And what I appreciate about scripture is it forces you not to solve your problem because human beings are a contradiction, but it forces you to be honest about the fact it doesn't allow you to lie to yourself. Because what people do is they convince themselves that the Kurds will do a better job than the Turks, and then we're screwed. And then we have yet another uh, manifest destiny mentality. So I'm very thankful for scripture because it keeps cleaning one's clock, so to speak. Yeah, and if I may push it uh, (laughs) to bring something which is beyond I know the Orthodox like this preposition beyond, beyond even civilization and shepherdism, which is already in 6 to 9, then again in 10, which is nature that I refer to as the left hand of God. And lately we had to deal with Harvey and Irma. Why did they happen? I don't know. (laughs) They just happened. People will explain it to you. But the disaster is unbelievable whenever you're dealing with winds, which is the Ruach, the spirit, the mighty wind of God, and the waters. Remember the flood and also the moistening of the bricks. It is the left hand of God. And I say so because we can forecast the water and the wind, but we cannot stop them. Even in Star Trek 4, you can forecast them, but you cannot stop them. Forecast will help some of us to get away and flee and so on. But how many times in the last two weeks I heard that the poor people could not leave, where would they go? And you could not say, well, it's just the poor, and but you are responsible, according to Matthew, for the poor. So, That also, let's go, whatever you may call it, nature, I don't care. All I'm saying in the Bible, this is stressed actually right from the beginning. Remember when the earth was tohu and bohu, it is because there was a mighty wind stirring the waters. Actually, at the beginning, I didn't have this in mind, but when you started talking, it popped there and it is of the essence that we remember that we are not in control you try to do to improve on buildings so that the earthquakes would not affect 
them as much as they affected them in the past. But you can never say they shall not be affected. You don't know. That's why the punishment of God is expressed often in natural disasters. All you have to do is to listen once to the book of Revelation. But again, people take it literally, and then at the end, they end up not knowing to do when they are hit with it. Well, stop praying. Just leave the city if you can. Evacuate! But do not imagine that you're going to stop it. Look how Irma fooled everybody. You know, we were supposed to be hit in North Carolina and on the shore, and then suddenly it shifted to the west, then to Tennessee, and so on and so forth, and we had just a little bit of rain. That's a consideration. Anyway, in the Odyssey, Ulysses went back to his home, but in Scripture, we don't have this. But if you are Greco-Roman, you're going to assume that. And in my book, I showed how the early Yehudim Jews were precisely Greco-Roman in their mind, Josephus, Flavius, and so on. But I don't want to enter into that. You know. So it's not only the Christians, it's the Jews, the Muslims, and so on. They speak about the Kaaba, and yet they have Damascus and Baghdad and cities. I mentioned earlier Geneva and Canterbury and Washington and Moscow. That's what you show the people. David started by conquering Jebus and called it his city, the city of David. But Peter the Great did the same thing with St. Petersburg. And the funny thing that he went to learn this in the Netherlands, which is Western Europe. <laughs> it's so ludicrous when I hear those stories from the biblical perspective. But you're not going to hear a Russian presenting this as something negative. It is positive. And he did that, and he built, and so on. Your comment allowed me to add this aspect of nature, and you could see the floods, and I said this in my book, can destroy cities at the edge of the wilderness, but never the wilderness. You go to the Middle East, the Syrian desert, there are still shepherds and flocks there. The way they were in those times, many of them nowadays, that's the joke amongst us in the Middle East, have cell phones. <laughs> that's the difference. But again, they use it to do business by advertising how they can get you on a camel tour. So the phone is still functional in their own society. But anyway, that's a footnote to make my hearers smile at the end. Thank you very much, Father Paul. We are smiling. Really appreciate it. And I hope that our listeners today will consider very seriously this proposition that the biblical God functionally is the absence of human control. Yes, so that when you do, remember again my book of books, Matthew, when you do the good, it's because he asks you to do so. That's why you do the good, so that the people will glorify your Father who is in heaven. If this is not total emasculation, then what is? There is no room in Scripture. We have always to add in Scripture so that anyone who is tempted to say, however, I, Father Paul, is already eliminated. Remember in Genesis 2, there was no plant yet because it has not rained yet. And who sends the rain? It is God. And then he planted a garden. That's the way it is. That's the way it should be, Father Paul. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Thank you. The Bible as Literature is a production of the Ephesus School Network.